riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Today we're going to meet the Soviet Army, the largest force of men under arms in the world, whose shadow casts an ominous threat to our way of life. Accurate statistics are almost impossible to obtain. The Russians are pretty secretive about military affairs. But there is no doubt that their total military establishment is unequaled in size on Earth. You remember that I called it not the Red Army, but the Soviet Army. The Russians stopped calling their military the Red Army after World War II, when new national symbols like the word Soviet replaced words like red with its ties to the revolutionary past. About two-thirds of the Soviet Army's ground soldiers are draftees, the rest being long-term professionals. An American GI gets $78 to $85 per month, but a Soviet private gets $6 a month to $8 a month. A Soviet soldier lives mostly on black bread and soup. Maybe he gets white bread three or four times a year. His life is pared down to the bone, without pampering. In a moment, we're going to meet these men who symbolize the power of Russia. This is the oath taken by Soviet army soldiers, and it is taken very seriously. I, a citizen of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, entering the ranks of the Soviet army, do take this oath and do solemnly swear to be an honest, brave, disciplined, vigilant fighter, to guard military and state secrets strictly, and to obey all military regulations and the orders of my officers and those in authority over me. I shall always be ready to defend my country, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, at the bidding of the workers and peasants government, and as a fighter of the Soviet army, I swear to defend it courageously, ably, worthily, and honorably, not hesitating to sacrifice my blood and even my life to achieve complete victory over the enemy. If I willfully break this solemn oath, then may the stern judgment of the Soviet law and the universal hatred and scorn of the working people strike me. Now let's meet the men who take that oath. The United States Department of Defense rates Soviet armed forces as a balanced, mature, and excellently performing army, as well as an army of very large size. This is the Red Army on parade in Moscow. Let us look at it and judge it with the Pentagon's appraisal in mind. This is the Russian army at the close of World War II. It walks as it makes its way to Berlin. It was a strong army composed mainly of infantry and it won the war on its feet. This is the US army at the close of World War II. It rolls as it makes its way to Berlin. It was a strong army and it helped win the war with some of the finest equipment ever turned out. The United States and Russian armies met as friends, comrades in arms, at the Elbe River at Torgo, 75 miles south of Berlin, at 40 minutes after 4 o'clock in the afternoon of April 25th, 1945. We were all allies. Comrades in arms, comrades in leadership, Zukov, Ike, and Monty. Now U.S. and Russian troops meet again, but they meet as enemies. 
tanks, base tanks. Let's take a look at the history of the Russian army. Even under the Tsar, it was huge, the largest standing army in Europe. Tsar himself was their commander-in-chief. His young son was second in command. To the Tsar and his family, the troops were toy soldiers, playthings with which to pass a quiet afternoon. The troops had other uses. The masses of Russia, they were the Tsar's strong right arm in putting down uprisings and riots. Witness the battle of the Odessa steppes. As the First World War turned against Russia, the empire shook. The soldiers turned against the little father, against the Tsar, and the revolution was on. Communists won. With Lenin as master of Russia, an army had to be formed. The communists at first thought that a mere militia would be sufficient to defend their new state. However, they were soon disillusioned. Leon Trotsky organized the first Red Army on a professional basis. Trouble was suppressed. The revolution was won. After the success of the revolution, the communists accepted the idea that the USSR, as a great power, needed a modern, well-equipped military establishment which would give force to its ideas. Military schools and academies were organized. So were territorial units comparable to national guards. Tactical commanders, as opposed to political commissars, were given more dignity and responsibility. Thus, by the early 30s, with the first five-year plan supplying needed war material, the USSR began to develop its military establishment. Joseph Stalin. He grew suspicious of the army leaders and in the purges of 1936 through 1938, he wiped out most of the Russian general staff. Chief among those to go were General Yegorov, General Blucher, and most important of all, the capable chief of staff, Marshal Tukhachevsky. The evidence against the generals had actually been planted by Adolf Hitler. The Gestapo had leaked the material to the Czechs, and President Benes of Czechoslovakia turned it over to Stalin. The purges damaged the morale and the readiness of the Soviet armed forces. When the Nazis rolled against Russia, the initial Soviet reaction was panic. The German army rolled forward, seemingly invincible. 
but the initial Soviet panic was suppressed by swift and forceful measures. Line units in the path of the German advances were sacrificed in order to gain time for consolidating decisive reserves. The populace was rallied to the defense of home and country by appeals to patriotism rather than to communist doctrine. Although the Soviet forces suffered severe casualties, they were not broken by the German offensive. And in the winter of 1942, the counteroffensive which marked the turning point of the war was launched at Stalingrad. In the Ukraine, a then obscure figure moved in with the troops, Nikita Khrushchev. Even then, his favorite greeting was a hearty kiss. The Nazis were gradually repulsed, and in January 1945, the Soviets unleashed the final offensive which opened the way to Berlin. And so we return again to that brief period when U.S. and Russian troops were comrades in arms. But we were comrades only briefly. When the war ended, the U.S. demobilized. Russia still kept an enormous army. Stalin needed it for his adventures in Eastern Europe. Adventures that culminated in the takeover by communists of the Eastern European countries. In the education of the soldier, children play war games. In Russia, the targets are capitalists. Notice the high silk hat and the cigarette? Next step, from the streets to the Suvorov, or military preparatory schools, which were organized during World War II to supply trustworthy future leaders. At least 15 of these schools are believed to exist at the present time. It was originally intended that the Suvorov schools would take only the orphans of World War II army heroes. Entrance requirements have since been changed, however, to include war orphans and sons of living army officers and Communist Party dignitaries. Candidates must be between 10 and 13 years of age at the time of application, must be above average both physically and mentally. After admission, cadets receive a five to seven year course of instruction, the length depending upon the previous education of the cadet. The program of studies resembles that of the former Tsarist Imperial Cadet Schools. Students receive an above average secondary education, which includes instruction in Russian language and literature, mathematics, history, geography, the natural sciences, the Soviet constitution, one or two foreign languages, horsemanship, dancing and physical education. Cadets are trained in military subjects, such as military history, army regulations, drill, small arms firing, tactics, and motor vehicle driving and maintenance. They also are thoroughly indoctrinated with communist propaganda. Upon graduation, those students who elect to enter the army ground forces are assigned immediately to officer candidate schools. Most Suvorov schoolboys are turned into efficient Soviet officers. In a moment, we shall see how the Russian soldier lives, the kind of training he gets compared to that of our GIs, and some of Russia's techniques of warfare. And now let's see how a Russian soldier lives. First, of course, Private Ivan gets his army haircut. A 
typical weekday training schedule in the Soviet Army ground forces is as follows. 6 to 6.10 a.m., Reveille. 6.10 to 6.30, sitting up exercises. 6.50 to 7, inspection. 7.40 to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, training period. That's six hours and 20 minutes of training. 4.20 to 6.20, training period, two more hours. 3 and artillery troops receive 64 hours of political indoctrination during their winter training period, in addition to two hours devoted nightly to discussions of political themes. Political officers, called Zampolitz, are attached to all units down to battalion and probably company level. These men are devoted communists charged with the responsibility of creating the proper mental attitude in the peasant mind of the average Soviet soldier. In addition to the Red Army, the Soviets have another potent force, guerrilla bands. The effectiveness of guerrillas was first recognized by the Russians during World War II, when armed partisans operated behind the Nazi lines, wreaking havoc and enforcing loyalty by killing collaborators. Castro and his men in the hills used one of the weapons originated by the Russians during the Second World War, the Molotov cocktail. The effectiveness of guerrilla warfare is well recognized. But the Russians claim it's their creation and something new. This is another type of warfare, new in its intensity, ancient in its origin, war by guerrillas, subversives, insurgents, 
assassins, war by ambush instead of by combat, by infiltration instead of aggression, seeking victory by eroding and exhausting the enemy instead of engaging him. It is a form of warfare uniquely adapted to what has been strangely called wars of liberation. To undermine the efforts of new and poor countries to maintain the freedom that they have finally achieved. It preys on economic unrest and ethnic conflict. It requires in those situations where we must counter it, and these are the kinds of challenges that will be before us in the next decade, if freedom is to be saved, a whole new kind of strategy, a wholly different kind of force, and therefore a new and wholly different kind of military training. America has the tradition of guerrilla fighting 150 years before the Soviet Union was formed. In the American Revolution, the American tradition of engine fighting, Minutemen, Green Mountain Boys began. America maintains that tradition as it trains its soldiers in the techniques of guerrilla warfare. good our training is, is being demonstrated on the battlefields of the underdeveloped nations of the world. Where communist guerrillas infiltrate our allies, we are training these allies in those same guerrilla tactics to enable us to meet this new threat to our freedom. The United States Department of Defense, Department of Defense, has this to say of the average Soviet recruit. Most of the population is of peasant stock, inured for generations to hard manual labor. As a soldier, he has an extraordinary capacity to withstand extreme deprivation. He can get along with makeshift equipment and with few welfare provisions. Because of his background, the Soviet soldier is by and large an intellectually more simple person than most of his Western counterparts. He seems willing to accept severe regimentation, harsh discipline, and restricted movement as a normal part of military life. Although self-discipline is not usually a character trait, the recruit responds obediently to imposed discipline. With such an amenable attitude, and because of his meager economic background, the Soviet soldier often finds army living standards and working conditions superior to those in civilian life. Another important quality is his deep-seated patriotism. By its nature, Soviet political philosophy does not encourage a willingness to accept responsibility in its citizenry. In America, where freedom is the stuff of life, the soldier is a man armed with the spirit of democracy. 
And this is one weapon, and it is the greatest of all, which the Soviet army does not have.